Little did I know that my grumpy German genes would one day become an absolute wonderful source for the research on happiness. And to make matters worse, I live in Singapore, which apparently you do as well. And I don't know if you knew that Singapore is considered the least happy Asian country and even the least emotional country in the world. So you may wonder, what does a German living in Singapore have to say about happiness? Well, the most interesting, <laughs> the most interesting finding about happiness was about unhappiness. And I made it at the place you would least expect it, in Bhutan. In Bhutan, I met the father of gross national happiness, Dashu Kamaura. Bhutan, for your information, abolished gross domestic product about 10 years ago, because they said it doesn't measure what <laughs> what's really worth measuring. And thanks. So in Bhutan, they implemented the Gross National Happiness Index. They tried to measure what makes the people happy, and that's what politicians and the king would focus on. So at that place, that after Disney World is the happiest place on earth, as they say, I discovered something about unhappiness. Dashu invited me to his living room for a cup of tea, and we had a conversation about happiness. And he said, happiness was about silencing contaminated thoughts. I thought that was pretty interesting. I came to explore happiness, and he told me it was about unhappiness and how its silencing would lead to happiness. So I focused my research on unhappiness, and there were four findings that I would love to share with you today. The first thing is fairly easy. Genetically, we're not meant to be happy. This is a very modern idea. We were meant to detect the negative, to constantly doubt and find the negative before it finds us. So our very modern idea of happiness is covered by a thick layer of unhappiness, negativity, and doubt for survival reasons. Let me give you a few examples where that negativity hits you every day. Two thirds of our emotional vocabulary in the English language describe negative emotions. The English language makes it much easier to describe negative emotions than positive emotions. Two thirds out of all the words we use are about negativity. When you open the newspaper, on average, nine out of 10 news articles are about negativity, such as crime, corruption, malpractice, abuse, war, terror, death, you name it. Now, all that would not really matter if negative and positive, unhappy and happy, would equal each other out. But Daniel Kahneman found out that losing $10 hurts us a lot more than finding $10. He won the Nobel Prize for that, so it sort of got to be right. And we can do a test to find out if that applies to you. By a show of hands, who has a hand? <laughs> all right, that's a test. By show of fans, who has withdrawn money from an ATM? By show of fans, who counts the bills when they come out? For those of you who just raised your hand, how many times have you gotten cheated by the ATM machine? I predict zero times. But we still count every single time. We have never been cheated before. But the thought of one $10 bill being too little just hurts us so much that we cannot take that. Every time we count those bills because we are afraid to lose money, even though we haven't had any bad experience. So in other words, we need to find a lot more $10 bills to make up for the loss of a single $10 bill. Genetically, we are wired to detect the negative. And in some cases, a single negative observation can destroy an entire history of positive and happy moments. Just think about a relationship and what happens if you cheat on your partner just once. Not cheating on your partner for a day cannot make up for cheating one day. 
So you may have a relationship of 10, 20 years, a moment of dishonesty, uncarefulness, or cheating <coughs> destroys an entire history of positivity. And what does this lead to? To something very scary. Imagine we would line up all the people in the world from the least happy to the most happy person. Just imagine that for a second. And now try to imagine the person on the far left side, the unhappiest person on the world, on the planet. Imagine that person for a moment. It is quite easy for us to imagine him or her. We can probably even, with empathy, find out why he or she is so happy. There might have been abuse, drugs, addiction, disease, war, terror. We can relate to that person. Now come with me to the other side. Think of the happiest person on this planet, the yellow person. We struggle to just imagine what that person would be like. Would he just smile all day and whistle and be happy? And if I would introduce that person to you, I dare say you would feel a bit uncomfortable. And you might even judge that person. You might even say, how dare he be so happy? Doesn't he see what's going on in the world? All the misery? All the bad stuff? How dare he be so happy? So, genetically, we are programmed to detect the negative, to doubt, to relate to that. That's why Dashu Karmaura in Bhutan told me it's about silencing the negativity to get to happiness. And once we silence negativity, it's about training ourselves to not neglect the positive. Now, this is a life hacking conference, so I thought I have to bring some hacks, which, which you guys hopefully look forward to. To summarize, silencing unhappiness may not be the worst start to have a happier life. Now, how do we do that? What I'm going to hack you with or teach you is not going to show you a beautiful picture of what life should be like and how happy life should be like. It's also not going to teach you how to paint your own beautiful painting of life. All it's meant to do is to increase your eyesight. So you see something beautiful even in the ugliest and most boring picture. Here's my piece of code for life hacking. I programmed it and it's quite easy as some of you may not be programmers. E equals I plus R. Our emotions equal a piece of information plus our reaction. Now between the I and the R, we have a little bit of time to constantly make a decision on how we react to new information. That new information could be you get a new job, you get fired. You fall in love, you fall out of love. Something happens. Someone dies or someone steps into your life. We don't really have a lot of control over the I. We do have a certain degree of control over the R, our reaction. Let me share a story with you that tells you the same story, E equals I plus R. And that story comes from Bombay. I was in India giving a presentation for my real job. And I was at the Shangri-La. There were about 60 clients of ours. It was an evening dinner presentation. I was jet lagged. I was nervous. So I asked one of the waiters at the Shangri-La, could you get me a cup of cappuccino, sir? I'm jet lagged and I'm a bit nervous. So he said, certainly, sir. So a little bit later, he came back. He put the cappuccino down. I put in half a package of sugar, had my cappuccino, and the presentation would start. It was about half an hour, maybe an hour, followed by a long dinner. I was even more exhausted when we went for dessert. So the same waiter walks by and I say, excuse me, sir, could you bring me another cup of cappuccino? He said, yeah, certainly, sir, I'll, I'll be right back. So he comes back and not wanting to interrupt the conversation that was going on, he puts the cappuccino down, he whispers in my ear, here's your cappuccino, sir. I already put in half a package of sugar, just like you had it last time. I was amazed. Not only did I not realize until that moment that I only have half a package of sugar in my coffee, but he realized that before me. I was amazed how much attention a person would pay to detail in a room full of 60 or 100 people. So I looked for that guy. I was speechless, and when I looked for him, he was gone. So I went through the kitchen area and looked for that guy. And I said, listen, 
With half a package of sugar, you left a far bigger impression on me than your vice president marketing of Shangri-La Group worldwide. <laughs> Why do you do that? Do, do you do that for all the people that you serve? And he was smiling, and it was a very genuine smile. And probably it was not the most prestigious job in India or even within the Shangri-La Group. And he said the following. He said, sir, I'm really happy to see your smile. Because you realized that I realized. And I, I was happy. I said, yeah, OK, that makes sense. <laughs> and then he said something more interesting. He said, but to be honest, between you and me, I don't do this for you. I do it for a very selfish reason. You see all my other colleagues. I have about 30 colleagues on the shift. They run 10-hour shifts. But I bet my 10-hour shift is much more delightful than theirs, because I change my 10-hour shift to what I believe is an awesome shift. And every smile that I get makes me happy and makes the 10 hours much shorter. Again, 30 of his colleagues had the same job, but his reaction to his job was vastly different. Now, you guys in the room, you all see the same presentation. But if someone from the outside interviews every single one of you, everyone has an entirely different memory of this presentation. Some say it was wonderful. Others say it was awful. It was boring. Some may pick something up that they can apply later on. Others may pick something up that they do not want to do when they present themselves. Let me repeat. E equals I plus R and how you can make a difference with half a package of sugar. Look at the R. This is where you have an influence over. And there are certain things you can do. You can silence the negative. I read a, a life hacking trick, and it said the following. Only the person who runs after the bus or MRT is mad if he or she doesn't catch it. I changed that behavior. I tried it. I do no longer run for the bus or the MRT. It, it sounds silly. It makes a difference. If you make it, you feel like the proudest person because all the people that were rushing by, you're like, yeah, man, what the hell? <laughs> if you don't make it, you don't feel guilty. You say, I could have caught it, but you know, I'm relaxed. I, I don't do this. When you stop counting the money from the ATM, you'll feel better. Try it out. Next time you draw money from the ATM, just be your daredevil. Don't count the bills. Just put it in your pocket. It will make a difference. The next time you're at a long queue or someone runs late for a meeting, I am German, we are punctual, I hate people being late a minute. Yesterday I met friends, the first friend who, who would arrive at the restaurant was 45 minutes late. She was the Indian, the Singaporeans were even slower. I did not bother, I had a good book, I was reading. I learned that someone gives me time, if he runs late, to read or to, to WhatsApp or whatever you want to do. So it's about silencing or bridging that negativity. But also, don't neglect acknowledging the silence, the absence of negativity. How often do you brush your teeth in the morning thinking, how wonderful I don't suffer any cavity pain today? Well, probably not a lot of times. How often do you think, so wonderful, I haven't any broken fingers or, or legs. But when you play basketball or, or soccer, once it hits you, you're like, oh, jeez, man. I, I didn't know how often I need my thumb that I just broke. So also appreciate what is not happening, the miracles that are not present. There is no war in this country at the moment. You are probably all healthy at the moment. Appreciate those things. And then also, don't forget the positive. When you have lunch in a moment, for five seconds, maybe 10 seconds, just shut up, bite into that burger or sell it, and just appreciate it. Find out what that reminds you of. If you like it or don't like it, appreciate those moments. If it's birds singing or food, take time to appreciate that. Now, back to the story. Let me give you one final example. E equals I plus R. Half a package of sugar or working on the R. The last example is this. Whenever you point at something, I always think it's the right hand pointing, if I point at someone, at a problem, at a thing, something that bothers me, if I point at something and I'll mirror myself, if I point at something, three fingers point at me. There is one problem and it's up to me how I react to it. This is where the R comes in. 
someone is being late, how do I spend my time? I cannot beam that person to come. I cannot change my boss. My boss bothers me, what can I do about it? Think about that when you have problems and when you point at people or other things. In Asia, you point like this, so it's even worse. You have four fingers pointing back at you. So you're even more responsible. Putting all this together, we're programmed to detect the negative, to constantly doubt and fear for the worst. We need to practice and train our brain for those other things where we can have a, make a difference and where we have a choice. The life hack is not only remembering E equals I plus R, half a package of sugar, or pointing at someone means pointing at you. The next time you eat something sweet, which may happen in a moment, think of something positive. The next time you go to the ATM, be your daredevil. Don't count those notes. You have never been cheated before. Don't fear anything. The worst thing that could happen is you're short $50. I think the, the maximum is $100, which only pops out at the airport, I think. Be a daredevil. Don't count the money. And if someone runs late for a meeting, it's up to you how you spend that time. Now, finally, I have the answer to the ultimate question of happiness or unhappiness. Is the glass of water half full or half empty? It's a world premiere. I've never shared this before. I tried to paint it, paint, painted it to get the IP rights many times, but it wouldn't get through. So it's not about thinking whether it's half full or half empty. Again, it is about pointing. If I point at this glass of water, it depends on what I want to do with it. Do I want to mix it with juice to make it less sweet? Do I want to put a flower in here that brings me joy? Do I want to freeze it and use it as cooling device? Do I want to heat it up and just pour it into a cup of, uh, into a cup of tea? It is up to you on how you want to use it. And only then can you say it's too little or it's too much. You could also say, I just simply want to drink it and it might be enough. And it doesn't stop here. Now it gets tricky. So I don't have to clean it up. OK, it's supposed to break. <laughs> I swear it's real glass. OK. If it breaks, it does not matter as long as I know what I want to do with it. If it breaks, I may melt it and make marbles for kits, or I make art out of it. It is up to you on how you respond to things breaking and not up to the device. Thank you very much for your attention. Sorry about that. That was supposed to break, and I'll just take it home from here. Do you guys have any questions? Yes. I just tried to verify what argument you were saying. You said uh, genetically we are programmed to be unhappy and negative. And the fact that you gave is that uh, two thirds of the English words is focused on happy, unhappiness. Mm -hmm. Is that a research result? Yes. Of the English language. Yes, that means probably English people are more likely to be unhappy than Indian, Chinese, or... Honestly, I, I've... I've been very interested in this linguistic, mm -hmm. the culture, so I want to figure out, do you have like, any research on other languages, and like, what's the relationship to... I, I don't, yeah. but your thinking tells me they must be very unhappy, because two-thirds of the English language. Where are you from, may I ask? Sorry? Where are you from? Uh, China. China. So maybe in Mandarin, you have four-fifths of the emotional vocabularies describing negative words. Or you, you have two-thirds describing positive. I do not know. I am German. I don't even know for German. The, the research I've done is, is for the English language. And back to your earlier point, we are genetically wired not to be unhappy,
but to constantly look out for the negative, the bear. Remember the bear? Women were not supposed to pick berries and get an orgasm and be happy about it. They wanted to survive. And we men were not saying, wow, it's great to hunt. We were scared of the bear and the mammoth and everything. We wanted to survive. So we constantly looked out and tried to listen to what was going on in the bushes. That's where we are trained to constantly doubt the ATM example. It, it just hurts a lot more to lose $10 than to find $10. Other questions? Yes? Well, then there's also the interesting debate of nature versus nurture because there are some professions, for example, um, sorry if I might offend anyone, but perhaps professions like engineering, whereby we always talk about failure. So we always learn from failure about what doesn't work. We always look at the negative and say, okay, so this is what doesn't work. So how would you make sense of that? Obviously, the environment shapes who you are. So yes, to a certain degree, we are bound to live within a certain world. At the same time, I wonder, and I do not have the perfect answer for that yet, I come to this country, which is the cleanest country in the world, the least corrupt, the safest, and one of the richest. I love this country. I do never complain about traffic jam here, maybe when I'm in Bangkok, Jakarta, or Bombay. But Singaporeans complain about traffic jam, right, and long queues. At the same time, they queue at the longest queue at the Hawker Center, which makes me scratch my head sometimes. So yes, to a certain extent, it's about the environment, but also a lot of nurturing. How do I look at the environment? E equals I plus R. The same people live in this country. Some think there is a lot of traffic going on, and the MRT is constantly full. Others go on the same MRT, and they're just happy to get home, or that it's air conditioned, or that it's so cheap, or works so well. So it really depends on how you perceive and interpret your environment, I believe. Other questions? Yes. Hello, Gabriel. So um, in Singaporean schools, you know, like when a student comes out of a project with an idea, as in, like, it's like it's, it can change the world, something like that. But in Singapore, like, immediately when you say something, like, um, something creative, the teacher puts you down and said, no, we don't have the funding for it, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of unhappiness that happens. So when we go to the working world, we're not able to compete, you know, like the foreign counterparts, because our thoughts are being, you know, put down. We're not able to think. Everything is like spoon fed. You know, like the four equation, we're just we're just studying for the sake of it and then going for the qualifications. So like people like me who want to be an entrepreneur where you say, you know, let's let, let's do something about it and Go for us, you know, like it's very hard for people like us to to generalize, to revolutionize like the thinking for kids or whatever. How do you think that you know this can be solved as in the unhappiness because we're not able to do a platform for Okay. I'm not sure if I'm qualified to comment on how to change the educational system for an entire country. What I've read is what what you just said, that the OECD study on, on education worldwide and the countries who rank really high are about just learning the textbooks, like vocabulary. There's, no, there's only black and white. Now, the countries who do not do as well, they're more entrepreneurial. Israel, for example, they do not have black and white. They have many colors, 50 shades of gray, haha. <laughs> <laughs> so this makes a huge difference, obviously. You cannot change the system, but you have done the first step. You are is you have identified already that the system exists and you will adapt to it. You will not let them destroy your creativity. You will step out and say, okay, I know the rules in this game. I'll play my own game outside of school or once I become an entrepreneur or dreampreneur. Yes. Okay, I'd be happy to answer more questions over there at uh, the lunch menu. And I got a wireless mic, so I'll be the first one over there and I'd be happy to exchange further thoughts and questions with you. Thank you very much.